Robert Nozick developed an alternative theory of justice in his 1974 book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. It won the National Book Award for that year, which is unusual for a philosophy book. Nozick's theory is described as a theory of justice in holdings. He doesn't like the term distributive justice because it suggests a central authority that is doing the distributing. He says, look, that's misleading. Quite frequently, goods and responsibilities actually come into existence attached to particular people. The basil I grow in my own backyard is mine. I'm the one who's growing it. It's not like it's in some central storehouse to be distributed among members as some authority chooses. And the same thing is true of all sorts of other goods that people actually grow or produce or find or intellectual property that they think up. Those are goods that have come attached to particular people. Responsibilities can be the same way. If you have a child, that child is your responsibility. It's not just some free-floating responsibility and then we have to decide from a social point of view what to do with it. It's something that you took on. The same thing is true if you make a promise. It's your responsibility to fulfill it. It's not just some general social responsibility that we can then allocate according to some scheme of distribution. So instead of talking about distributive justice, Nozick talks about justice in holdings. And he calls his theory the entitlement theory. Under what circumstances are you entitled to a holding? There are three basic components of his theory of justice in holdings. The first is a principle of acquisition from nature. A holding is going to be just if it conforms to the principle of justice in acquisition. There are ways in which I do acquire things from nature. I grow the basil in my backyard, for example. I grow the bushes in my own front yard. I may be somebody who goes through the woods, as in Locke's example, and gathers acorns from the woods. Perhaps I hunt or fish. Perhaps I engage in oil exploration or natural gas exploration. Or I start mining minerals on my land. All of those are things that involve me acquiring some kind of good from nature. That's an acceptable way to do it. Now, so far you might notice, I haven't actually told you what that principle is. I've simply said you've got to conform to a principle of justice in acquisitions. Acquiring something from nature is one way, in fact a fundamental way, of getting something justly. But under what conditions? What does this principle actually look like? It isn't the job of a philosopher, Nozick says, to spell that out. We have a complicated body of law that governs agriculture, that governs oil and gas leasing, that governs mineral rights, that governs intellectual property. There are all sorts of things that we include under this general category of acquisitions from nature. And to say what's just is complicated. We would have to have a principle that says what is just in land ownership and in growing things on that land, what's just in mineral exploration, oil exploration, gas exploration, extremely complicated factors here. And so there's a huge body of law that specifies what that principle is. The second component of the entitlement theory is a principle of justice and transfer. We have to say how it's possible for me to hold justly something by getting it from somebody else who holds it justly. And so we have to have a principle that tells us what's fair, what is just in buying and selling and gift giving and other kinds of transfer of title from one person to another. Once again, that's going to be a complicated body of law that spells that out in terms of commercial transactions and gifts and estates and all sorts of other kinds of transactions involving contracts, involving buying and selling, and so on. And so that's going to be complicated. But one way of holding things justly is to hold them in conformity with the principle of justice and transfer. It basically says, I got this from someone else who held it justly, by legitimate means, by means that we have declared as just. The principle of justice in transfer, notice, is going to be justice preserving. We can start chains of just holdings in terms of acquiring things from nature, and then we can perpetuate that and transfer these things from one person to another. And so the key point about that principle of justice in transfer is that it's going to be justice preserving. It will take some initial condition that is just and transform it into another condition that's just. 
Well, if the world were perfect, those would be the only things we would need in a theory of justice. We would simply then have a closure condition that says a holding is just if and only if it conforms to the principle of justice in acquisition and the principle of justice in transfer. But the world isn't entirely just. People do things wrong. People injure other people. People commit injustices. They commit crimes. And so how do we compensate for all that? We have to have another principle that says how we basically take something that's gone wrong and set it right again. So there's also going to have to be a principle of rectification. The rectification principle will tell us how to turn an unjust situation into a just one. And so we'll be able to say that a holding is just if it conforms to the principle of justice in rectification where, in other words, you've gotten it as compensation for an injury, or you've gotten it as compensation being a crime victim, or something like that, where some injustice has occurred and we've set it right again by fixing the circumstance. A distribution, in the sense of a set of holdings, according to the entitlement theory, is just if everyone's holdings under it are just. So what can we say about just distributions? A distribution is just if it arises from another just holding by legitimate means. What Nozick is giving us is something like a recursive theory of justice. We will have the, as our base case initial acquisitions from nature, and then we have recursive conditions that say we can transform a just situation into another just situation by the principle of justice and transfer. We can also transform an unjust situation into a just situation by the principle of justice and rectification. Another way to look at this is that there should be a chain of holdings from any just holding all the way back to an initial acquisition from nature, every step of which is just, or every step of which involved correcting an earlier injustice. So we could say that chain has to go back to an initial just acquisition or a set of initial just acquisitions. And in that process, there should be no uncorrected injustices. So think about my shirt, for example. Where did I get my shirt? Well, as a matter of fact, I got this from Goodwill. They presumably got it from a donation. They got it from somebody who bought it at a store, a retailer. They got it from some wholesaler. They got it from some factory that put it together from cloth and other things that were acquired from nature. And so as long as every step in that process was just, the holding is just. One of my most prized possessions is this baseball. It's an official 1979 World Series baseball signed by Bowie K. Kuhn Commissioner, 76th World Series. Where did I get it? I got it in the first inning of Game 5 of the 1979 World Series. Dave Parker was at bat for Pittsburgh. Mike Flanagan, the Baltimore pitcher, threw the pitch, and Parker fouled it toward the third base stands. My brother and I were there in the very first row by third base. Well, I could see Doug DeSensei, the Baltimore third baseman, running straight at us. Everybody in our stands was standing up like this, seeing that the ball was hit over in our direction. I looked up, but I couldn't see the ball. So what do you do when a foul ball is heading in your direction and you can't see it? I went like this. <laughs> now, luckily, it was late October. I was wearing a 1951 issue army jacket that was issued to my father during the Korean War, and it had big baggy pockets. The ball fell right into my pocket. I reached down, grabbed the ball, and managed to hold on, given that a bunch of other hands were suddenly in my pocket trying to grab the baseball. Well, that's how I got it. So <laughs> it was hit into the stands. It came off the bat of Dave Parker. The last person to actually hold it was Mike Flanagan. Where did he get it? Well, presumably from Rick Dempsey, the catcher. Where did he get it? Well, from the umpire. Where did he get it? Probably from the ball boy. Where did he get it? Well, from someplace in the back, ultimately from Major League Baseball. They got it from a factory in Costa Rica, and they put it together from various materials gained from probably farmers and others who obtained it from nature. As long as there are no uncorrected injustices in that chain, I hold the baseball justly. Nozick distinguishes different kinds of theories of distributive justice 
or as he would prefer to say, justice in holdings. A historical theory like his says that the justice of a distribution depends on how it came about. You can't just look at the distribution in the abstract and say whether it's just or unjust. You have to find out where people got these things. My Apple Watch here. Is it just that I have this Apple Watch? Well, the obvious question to ask is where did you get it? Did you buy it? Were you given it as a gift? Did you steal it? How, how did it? How did it come about that it's here on your arm? And so I would have to tell a story about where I got it, where that person got it, and so on and so forth, and track it back to make sure there are no uncorrected injustices. But there are other kinds of theories. An end result theory says that the justice of a distribution depends on overall structural features of the distribution, now or at some earlier time. And so it's one that just looks at the distribution itself apart from how it came about, apart from who exactly has what, and just looks at structural features. It might look at the degree of inequality, for example. It might, as in Rawls's difference principle, just focus on the welfare level of the least advantaged and make some judgment about justice based on that. It might be one that, like Rousseau, says, well, I want it to fit the common good, but also be within these boundaries. We're looking there at structural features. And so there I would not ask, well, how did you get the baseball or how did you get the Apple Watch? But is your possession of it something that promotes the common good? And does it obey the stricture that we should tolerate neither rich men nor beggars? Does it maximize in some way the welfare of the least advantage that you have it? And so forth. Really, to be fair to Rawls, it's not just my possession of that object. It's really the set of political institutions and economic institutions that led to my possession of it. And finally, we could have a pattern theory that says the justice of a distribution depends on its matching some other distribution, some natural distribution, or some weighted sum of those natural distributions. So we might say, as Aristotle does, for example, that we should distribute according to merit. Or we could have the Marxian principle from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. In general, pattern theory is going to fit that kind of formula, from each according to something to each according to something. Now, Nozick stresses that if we have an end result theory or we have a pattern theory, we're going to constantly have to be interfering in people's free choices. Why? Because they're going to make choices that depart from the pattern or that depart from our overall conception structurally of justice in our end result theory. People are going to make free choices that are going to make some people better off and some people worse off. They're going to pay to see somebody play basketball, for example. They'll pay to buy that person's watch or they will buy a ticket to a baseball game. Some people will end up better off, some people will end up worse off. Rawls responds that we're talking here about a set of social and political institutions. We're not talking about individual transfers and individual possessions. But I think Nozick's response is to say those institutions better be ones that allow for that kind of voluntary transfer. If you do allow for it, then you've got a version of a historical theory. If you don't allow for it, then you're going to constantly have to interfere in people's lives. So in the end, he says, suppose you opt for a socialist system, a socialist system that centralizes economic and political decision making, you will inevitably have to engage in that kind of interference with people's free choices. So he concludes, a socialist society would have to forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. To summarize his own theory, Nozick gives us the following formula. His theory is not patterned, but he mimics the overall formula of a pattern theory. And you'll see why it's not a pattern in a moment. He says, here's the best I could do in a formula for my theory, in a slogan, from each as they choose, to each as they are chosen. What we have there is not some natural dimension or anything like that, but instead people's free choices. I get what other people choose to give me or sell me or what I choose to acquire from nature. I give according to my free choices, to give to or to sell to others. That's what's involved in a free society, and it's what's involved in a proper understanding of justice and holdings.